morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Trevor Harp. I am the Director of Customer Success for Avatir Corporation. Uh, if uh, you're not familiar with Avatir, uh, we are a, uh, a total identity management uh, uh, solution provider. So uh, we offer everything uh, from self-service password reset solutions to fully automated uh, user provisioning and deprovisioning uh, to, uh, to compliance and governance across your organization. Uh, the focus of today's uh, speaking session is uh, to share with you a couple of case studies from two of our, uh, our very valued customers. Um, the first is uh, uh, going to be with uh, Computer Services Incorporated Managed Services. And uh, our speaker is going to be Gary Hine. Uh, he's the Cloud Services Manager for CSI. Uh, our second speaker today will be Will Cheng from uh, US Gypsum. And, uh, both of these are, uh, organizations are coming from different uh, perspectives uh, that we'd like to share with you. Uh, Computer Services has been an Avatir customer for uh, over 14 years at this point, uh, so they've had our solution in place for a long time, uh, whereas US Gypsum has had it for roughly a year and a half at this, uh, at this stage. And uh, so I kind of want to share with you, I guess, the pain points they were, they were experiencing from a uh, password reset perspective, how they went about finding a solution. Uh, what they've done to, to tackle that problem and, and what's resulted from it. So, um, I, at this point, uh, and then once we finish up with the case studies, we'll ask you to hold any questions till the end, then we can do a Q&A, uh, either for the speakers themselves or for Avatir. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to, to Gary. Well, I'm Gary Hine, and I am the Cloud Services Manager for Computer Services, Inc. Um, Computer Services is actually a core uh, processing company for banks, uh, credit unions, things of that nature. Um, as Trevor mentioned, uh, the company has been using uh, the Avatir solution um, for about 14 years now. Um, started off real small footprint um, and has recently started to grow quite a bit. Um, but roughly five years ago, Computer Services uh, purchased a company called Height, um, and that's the site I came from. Um, and Height was actually a managed services provider for banks, credit unions, basically financial institutions um, throughout the Midwest, California. From the session overview, basically my role, I am the cloud services manager which focuses on infrastructure. Um, my job is to take banks, credit unions, and move their infrastructure into CSI's cloud. Um, a lot of the banks and Credit unions are, you know, they're, they're a small, real small budget. Um, they weren't able to play with, you know, the big box banks and accomplish a lot of what they wanted to do. So we ended up using Avatir solution and it didn't come naturally. It was an afterthought and it worked out for us pretty well. But my role has been anything but help that. So the, how CSI was using the product, um, I was not familiar with it at all. Um, it started out as a lot of the banks, credit unions, they used uh, computer services for web hosting, site hosting, transmitting files to and from, entering the developers hop in, do website de design. Um, however, that, that group that I inherited after the acquisition, I, I didn't really know what it did. I know Trevor sent me invoices every six months. He told me to renew my maintenance, but I really didn't have any idea what it was. I know my engineers were responsible for password station. Um, I would always ask them, hey, what's the link to this? What am I buying? I, I had no idea. My team, we're responsible for what CSI refers to as the cloud suite. Um, our goal, like we said, is to take all of the bank's infrastructure, move it into the cloud. Um, the cloud obviously is the, the, new, the new fad. Um, it was what everybody heard about. Um, nobody really knew that Gmail, Hotmail, Outlook was cloud, but from a FI financial institution, small bankers. Um, we had to train them, we had to teach them what it is we were trying to accomplish. Um, but what we tried to, to do with our delivery solution was to benefit basically all groups. Um, our focus was on that frontline support, uh, the team that would answer all the help desk calls, the IT decision makers, as well as, and most importantly, that end user trying to do their work day, every day for us. So when I say, when you talk about cloud and cloud migrations into, from an infrastructure standpoint, have a lot of you and your companies made that transition yet, or is it still fairly new? So you're shaking your head back there. What, 
have you guys done complete migration, complete move, or just kind of getting your feet wet, or what, what are you up to? So, okay, so he was saying 70% has been moved to the cloud, um, and it's, it's scary for companies to do that. Um, the security of it, the big brother mentality, um, there's always been a lot of fears around it. So my number one hurdle always was convincing the banks of what we wanted to do. Um, you know, we, we touted it as achieve a response, it's scalable. I mean, we try to preach the same thing you hear on TV and all the ads, um, but it's easier said than done. So all of our game plan started when the financial kind of crisis started in 2008, give or take, 2008, 2009. Uh, companies became scared, IT budgets shrunk, companies were closing, and from our world it was real important because banks were being basically swallowed up by the feds. Um, they didn't have the value, they couldn't do it, it was not good for the consumer. So the FDIC ended up, uh, and FFIC started closing banks down left and right. Um, it was on the news every single evening. Um, so that is where, in our client advisory boards, it became a concern with all of our banks. They wanted to know, how can CSI help us? How can we get to that, you know, become secure? How can we become stable so that we're not one of these banks that you hear about on the news tomorrow night? Um, so basically, what we tried to accomplish was to bring that for these small financial institutions. Um, so you'd hear about the efficiencies, you hear about the gains, it didn't matter, but every night I'd go home, making dinner, kids are doing homework, put on some background noise, and it seemed like no matter what my wife turned on, it was always flip or flop or fix her up or, or something to that effect. I mean, it became the DIY, the new fat. You know, take the old, turn it into some new shiny toy. In this instance, cloud was that new shiny toy. Everybody wanted to go play with it. Um, you know, everybody was distracted. It was the squirrel, right? It was everything turned. You heard about it, you paid attention, but you really didn't know what it was. Um, so because of this conservative approach of banks, it was a challenge for us to get everybody on board. Um, but realistically, once they started getting their feet wet, whether it be with hosted exchange or, you know, just some file server or a public print server, whatever it might have been, it, it became pretty simple. Um, and that is the mindset we tried to teach everybody was always on, always open. Um, so as you can see from my point of view and my role, a password reset tool really wasn't a focus for me. Um, it was just something my team was responsible for. Um, I really didn't know why or what it did. Um, but Really what it came down to was that I had to find a way to accomplish these migrations and keep all three of those parties happy. One of our examples that I have is that morning after. We, we tried these migrations out of the, you know, right out of the box, really didn't have a plan. We just tried to do it for companies. It was troublesome. The, the end users were not happy. Um, they didn't like that change. Um, that was the biggest problem is they didn't really know what to expect, they didn't understand what they were getting, um, so there were failures. I mean, quite frankly, they were not good reviews. I mean, infrastructure-wise, it didn't matter how strong that infrastructure was, the end user wasn't comfortable, they weren't happy, it was a failure. I'm from Colorado, and I've actually been between the companies about 10 years now. Um, and there's a bank uh, down in Burlington, Colorado, little small town, three branch, the Eastern Colorado Bank. Um, when I first started with height slash CSI, when I walked in that first day in my office, I had, I was recruited as a senior engineer from a Microsoft and security standpoint. Uh, messaging and Citrix and things of that nature, that was my forte. Um, but inside my office, there were three Dell boxes and a little ticket on the side of it for the Eastern Colorado Bank, and my boss said, they want Citrix. I was like, all right, I didn't know anything about them. I had to build these three servers, throw Citrix on there. I knew nothing about the bank. I knew that I was putting three servers and somebody from our staff was gonna drive them down to the middle of nowhere, plug them in, and that was that. Um, so they've been a customer for quite a while. So from a cloud standpoint, there was trust. They, they trusted us. Um, and just recently, um, in February, the Eastern Colorado Bank was 
um, had a piece in the American Banker, uh, the magazine, the publication. Um, basically, the title was Skipping New Servers, Colorado Bank Goes Big in the Cloud. So over the years, we had convinced um, the Eastern Colorado Bank to go ahead and move all this infrastructure from 10 years ago, mind you, that Citrix environment, into our cloud. So at this point, their entire infrastructure is in my cloud. Um, that means that little closet in Burlington that also held the coffee filters and the granola bars and everything else, it's gone. Um, the servers have been finally put to rest in a better place and we're moving on. Um, however, there's not a lot of clients that will make that giant step. Um, they start with kind of that low hanging fruit. Um, but my introduction and, and with Avatir, leading up to this and those failures, was how do I make those end users happy? So I saw what this product did. Trevor gave me a demo. I actually finally, after four years, sat down and he gave me a demo and told me what this product can do. Um, it gave, us, gave me some ideas. And basically what I turned it into was a way to free up resources because of the whole economy and, and you know everybody being pretty frugal with spending. They weren't going to give me more resources to dedicate to that morning after, um, that day one. So the product basically, in a nutshell, what it was able to accomplish for us, it gave me two people. It gave me two people that I could dedicate to that morning after. Um, just from the help desk standpoint of our team, we expanded it into hosted exchange for starters which in turn allowed, our environment has 8,000, 8,500 mailboxes we host for these banks. Um, every one of those customers is told to use it. I know they don't use it, and then when they do, we have to buy more licenses because we have to hurry because we're told they're over our subscription, but we do it all the time. Those people that help that, it basically amounted to ideally 33% reduction from the staff needs helping passwords, or I can't log in. Because it doesn't matter how good everything is, the morning I log in there and I, the user tries to get online, if they can't get in, ah, it's, it's crazy, right? Everything breaks down. They don't know what to do. They're all flustered. They you know, talk to their neighbor about how things aren't working. It, it's a horrible solution. Why'd they do this? It's all because they couldn't remember that eight character sequence of letters and numbers. Um, so, giving me the people, this little slide here and the 33% reduction, in an average five day week, our help desk between eight and 12 takes, uh, what they tell me? Average is 3,400 calls or tickets in a five day, in a, during that four hour uh, period throughout the week. Of that 3,400, 750 to 800 of them, of those calls, are directly initiated by users. They're not automated server alerts or security concerns. They're directly those users calling in with problems regarding logins. Um, it, it's like a broken record. It didn't matter what sequence of events I looked at from, from what week to what month. Give or take 750 to 1,000 calls between 8 and 12 regarding I can't log in. I mean, it was all over the place. 250 to 400 were specifically just simple. I can't log in, will you reset my password? 2,700 minutes, roughly, is what we average from the ticket opening to ticket close for all those instances. And that's just in a five day period from eight to 12, which basically amounts to roughly 45 hours of resource time that I have saved. Now with Avatir, the customers are told, go here. The help desk support, when they answer the line, those customer service reps, they know, hey, did you go to this URL? They log in, they take care of themselves, calls now last two to three minutes or however long it takes them to get on a browser or on their phone, send a text message. Um, our team recently upgraded to the latest version um, with Avatir's professional services support just uh, three, four weeks ago. Um, and they're rolling out the text messaging to help um, so that they can just 
tell them. And there's always all these banks, um, they have kiosks, users, you know, they're as helpful for the employees as they are for the customers walking in the door. Um, but the 45 hours is huge. I mean, the, the, the decision makers, my VP, said no, I couldn't hire two more people or have two dedicated service desks or help desk people for that morning after we do our migrations. They wouldn't let me just have them dedicated to the staff. But because that is ultimately people I have to please, I had to find a way to make them happy, and this is how I was able to do it. Um, that 45 hours of resource time throughout the course of that 8 to 12 is huge. Um, guys can be dedicated, people can help out, and it allows for that end user to be, to log in, to do their job, and be comfortable with this migration and what we've done, instead of having that fear or that negativity that can, something as simple as a password doesn't work or I can't log in. Um, and that's roughly how computer services and my team with cloud services has adapted and been able to kind of keep, move, uh, keep business moving, increase the efficiencies, and keep those end users happy. And it is a whole lot easier for me to purchase a few licenses than it is to convince my VP that I need to hire a new employee that can just sit there and be dedicated to this purpose. So um, I guess I'll go, Will, if I want to hand it over to you, and then uh, questions we can take afterward. Thank you, Gary. All right, my name is William Chang, and I am actually the operations manager at United States Gypsum. Um, I want to give you a little more background on United States Gypsum. We are the manufacturer of drywall. We invented drywall. Um, our brand is actually sheetrock. And although we do uh, only focus on manufacturing drywall, we have other lines of businesses such as distribution and uh, research and development, making ceiling tiles, pretty much anything you need to build a house. We have presence in over five different continents across the world. And our headquarters is located in Chicago, Illinois, but we also have over 200 remote locations. And when I say remote locations, one of our plants is located hundreds of miles away from any other form of life, pretty much. Because let's face it, who wants to live next to a plant that digs up rocks, crushes it, mixes it with water and puts it in between two sheets of paper. That's like living next to a construction site that never stops building. I mean, it's loud. And we also have locations that are not so remote. Um, they are in major cities, and that's our distribution centers. It gives us an employee base of over 8,000 people. Now, USG, since we invented drywall, it's an old company. We pretty much have old technologies that we've implemented in the past and still use today. Technologies such as mainframe, the IBM i-series. But we also have new technologies such as Active Directory and SQL databases, Oracle databases, all that have a username and password. So we used Avatir to unify where people go and reset these passwords and how they reset these passwords. And Avatir helped us create the experience that we wanted to give to the end users to hopefully make them a net promoter of USG IT. Now, what do I mean by experience? For an experience at USG, I'm gonna go back to the basics and talk about, uh, I'll use a fish as an example. When you cast a line and you hook a fish, that is a commodity. When you take that commodity and put it on a shelf, then you have a product. Now let's take that product off the shelf, go to a restaurant, make it into a fish sandwich, serve it with some Coke and some fries, that you have a service. Now at this particular restaurant, if you are sitting at this restaurant and there's a large aquarium where as you're eating this fish sandwich, you have a shark swimming by, that is an experience. And that is something that USG is really trying to create in our IT department, is this, is this experience. And you might be wondering, what does a fish have to do with IT and the service desk? Well, pretty much the fish, we have fishermen in every company where they go out and they buy new technologies, new products, new software. And who do they expect to support it? Yes, the service desk and an IT. So we want to work with these fishermen to pretty much take the fish and package it up and put it on the shelves. 
And on our virtual shelves, we have different things such as uh, computer packages, password resets, even from um, access requests. Now we take that, um, these virtual shelves, if someone orders a laptop, we pretty much go, would you like a keyboard and a mouse with that? And that is where most companies are today with the service desk. Um, we provide a service. So how do we get to that next level and create the experience that people want to have? Um, I'm not saying go out and carry an aquarium with you every time someone asks for help. That's not, that is not what I'm trying to say. But what I'm trying to say is go out, talk to your customers, and what we, want, what we did was we wanted to create an experience with them and for them. So at USG, we have a variety of people in different age groups that work there. People from recent college grads to almost retiring. And every single person requires a different level of experience. So we have different cost models and our cost models for the, um, how they want to approach IT and how they want to get help. With self-service being the cheapest, and we have the service desk coming in with desk side services and our IT specialized team, and the most expensive being, of course, vendor support. Um, we created the experience with Avid here uh, by, they are actually our first way of having self-service. And we have password reset kiosks if people don't have access to another computer, or they don't have access to um, a, a phone that they can reset the password. These password reset kiosks also help the business and they can do other self-services in uh, doing their, um, their benefits <coughs> packages as well. So it's dual purpose password reset kiosk. We also created a walk up live support where people could go up and get that personal touch that they want. They can talk to somebody and pretty much see an aquarium in the background as they're getting help with their computer. Well, we don't have an aquarium. Maybe a screensaver with fishes swimming by. Um, we also have chat support, people who don't want to talk to, to anybody in person. And we have the traditional email and phone support. And what we're looking for in the future is actually live video support where they can go and experience someone on the computer, see them, talk to them, just like it would be walk up live support. In summary, we pretty much uh, used Avatir since 2014 and we use Avatir for a couple of reasons. We use them uh, mainly because they had our security uh, with personal identification questions. And what that is, is we didn't have a great way for people to identify themselves when uh, calling the service desk and verifying who they are. We used their phone number. That was not secure at all. We couldn't use their social security. Audit said no. So uh, we have about eight thousand employees and roughly seven thousand have signed up with this service and again we have people who won't sign up they don't use a computer they're just drivers so we as we predicted that pretty well um, Avatir also gave us the mobile support so for people in our remote locations there's no there's one or two computers at these remote locations at our plants they had the use of their personal mobile phones to reset their password um, they allow uh, the cross-platform support with our old technologies, the IBM i-series um, and Active Directory where they can reset the password at one location. Um, it also created some hard and soft savings again with having people using the lower cost self-service model. And what we really tried to do was increase our net promoter score for IT. Um, now, pretty much what you want to do and how you want to do it. I'm not saying go out and implement Avatir, just like I'm not saying go out and buy an aquarium. We did. And so far it's worked great for us. We've actually uh, seen some hard savings, about $100,000 a year in hard savings. And do 100% of the people use the password reset tool? No, not in our company. That's not our culture. 90, not even close. We would have about 50% usage of our password reset tool. But we still chose Avatir, and we wanted to have this solution out there to create that experience. The, um, the main focus for us, again, was the increasing our net promoter score. And that's 
what Avatir helped us do by creating a self-service model. Right now, I'd like to open up for any questions, and if uh, Trevor wants to say something, if Gary wants to come up, if you have any questions for us. We calculate the savings for us by we have an outsourced service desk that we pay per ticket. So the $100,000 savings comes from how much we pay per ticket and how, many, how much that password reset tool um, we, they use. And it's about 50%. So roughly about, I want to say we have about 1,000 people who reset the password um, through Avatir and 1,000 people who reset the password um, by calling the service desk or using it in the different means of services. So to repeat, um, do we have Max, and also are we using it for provisioning? Um, CSI ourselves do not have Max. The banks do have Max. Um, but from, uh, a, I don't believe I've heard of any problems or tricks with it, um, it's just like any other user. Um, and in regards to the provisioning, not right now. However, um, with this upgrade that we just did, um, we did actually see about that. Currently, we have another product in place that we use for the initial account provisioning, but we are looking to make that change right now, actually. Um, and the, the demo we saw, <laughs> pretty slick. And so, yeah, we're, I was talking to Trevor just down the hallway that next week we have to have a talk about this. So that's, that's our goal. So we, don't, we have Max in our environment, and they do use a password reset tool. Max don't integrate well with Active Directory, but they still need access to our network resources. So they do use it sometimes. Um, when they need to. As far as provisioning, uh, we do not use a provisioning tool today. We did uh, line up our future roadmap with Avatir, which is why we selected it. They did have the provisioning tool that we were looking for to implement in the future. We just didn't have the budget for it for when we did Avatir uh, password station. So the question is how many passwords or applications can the tool support? So uh, Avatir takes a, a hub and spoke approach so using eight, uh, Active Directory or LDAP as the, uh, as the hub, if you will. Uh, then we have out-of-the-box connectors for roughly 90 uh, systems applications, databases, directories that are out there uh, that, uh, that we can leverage for doing password resets and password synchronization across those systems. From our standpoint, we strictly did the, all of the, the users would receive a, like more, a packet essentially just a quick briefing, paper briefing on their desk, so they had it the morning, so they knew exactly how to handle where to go for the enrollment to get things started. It was step number two on that, on that packet, so. So the question was, how did we handle enrollment um, when we deployed Password Station? Um, that is actually a great question, and that's probably one of the hardest challenges that we had. How we handled the enrollment, I mean, we knew that we weren't gonna get 100% adoption, but we sent out emails, we leveraged um, I, uh, different leaderships and different departments to make sure that people would sign up for Password Station. And it's actually part of our onboarding process now to um, have the, the HR, as they go through orientation, have them sign up for Password Station. The question is, uh, we had, there's alternate ways to, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, enroll for Password Station, the one-time emails, SMS, at our company, we use both. Um, uh, in Active Directory, we store their email and their phone numbers, and some people we store their cell phone numbers as well. So we gave them the option to enroll on how they wanted to uh, be identified as this was them. We had them either send an SMS text message to use verification. We also had um, send an email, and if people don't have access to email, we had them call their, uh, their phones to verify that it is them. The other thing that uh, I'll mention just on the enrollment question is we do, uh, we do offer a mass enrollment. Sorry, a mass or a pre-enrollment solution as well. So uh, we can leverage a, a database of questions and answers that you have prepared. Uh, we can mass enroll users. Uh, it, that's one approach that a lot of large organizations will take to help drive that initial enrollment. And then, it, of course, the questions, yeah, used for that initial enrollment can then be expired so they'd be forced to choose new questions. That's a great question, and we absolutely can do that. That's actually part of, part of the Windows credential provider, so for that pre-network logon, we're gonna query AD, we're gonna check to see if they're enrolled in the solution. If they're not, we can set up an email only uh, warning period, say for a period of two months, we're gonna send emails on a weekly basis. 
I'm telling you, you need to enroll. By the end of this period, uh, you're gonna be forced to enroll. You'll have to enroll before you can log on to the network. And, uh, and then at another period where they'll receive uh, notifications on their, on their uh, at login that they need to enroll, uh, maybe say for the last week. At the end of that, if they have not enrolled, they'll be forced to enroll prior to being able to access the network. So yes, that's part of, part of the solution that can be enabled. Yeah, so the question is uh, multilingual support. Uh, out of the box, we currently support uh, 32 uh, different languages and dialects. And uh, through configuration, you can select what languages you want to expose. You can also uh, 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 configure how you want the language to be presented. It could be in a drop-down menu, for instance, uh, allowing the user to select. We can use the, uh, the browser language settings, auto-detect that to display it in that language. So it's really up to you. Well, great. Well, hey, thank you, everyone, for attending. We appreciate it. And uh, if you have any, want to talk to us one-on-one -on -one after this, feel free to come up. So thank you.